This is lecture number 11 by Robert Benoit on the Major Prophets, dealing with Isaiah. Lecture number 11. Let's go on to Isaiah chapter 30. I suggested that chapters 28 and 29 have their setting as a banquet of nobles celebrating their alliance with Assyria and Isaiah addressing those leaders of Judah. When you get to chapter 30, it's difficult to tell if it has the same setting or whether it's a completely different discourse at some later time. I think it's quite possible that the latter is the case. It seems to deal with something that took place later. You notice how it begins, and I quote here, Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without counseling me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. End quote. In other words, this is a response to what the nobles again are thinking. Look, they're saying, if you're condemning us for an alliance with Assyria, well, if that turns against us, we'll just go make an alliance with Egypt. We have another option, don't you know? It may be that's what they were thinking, or it may refer, and I'm inclined to this latter suggestion, to an actual attempt to do that, that is, to look to Egypt for help. If you look at Second Kings chapter 19, verse 9, you read there in the context of Assyria's attack on Judah in the time of Hezekiah, and beginning with verse 8 we read, and I'm quoting, when the field commander heard that the king of Assyria had left Lachish, he withdrew and found the king fighting against Libna. Now Sennacherib received a report that Tirhaka, the Cushite king of Egypt, was marching out to fight against him. So he again sent messengers to Hezekiah with this word, Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah. And so we proceed with Second Kings chapter 19, with more, which I won't quote directly. So in Second Kings, chapter 19, verse 9, you have a reference to this Ethiopian king coming out of Egypt to fight against Assyria. So that may be what's in view here, when Judah seeks some sort of aid from Egypt in the face of the Assyrian threat. But in any case, that's just some suggestions with respect to the background for this chapter. As far as what chapter 30 says, if you look at verses 1 to 7, it's rebuke for Judah for failing to seek their help from the Lord and turning to Egypt instead. And verses 1 to 7 say that that will be of no benefit or help to them. So we read, Woe to those who go down to Egypt. We read that in verse 2. Then verses 3 to 6 say, quote, But Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. Though they have officials in Zoan, part of Egypt, and their envoys have arrived in Hanis, again part of Egypt, everyone will be put to shame because of a people useless to them, who bring neither help nor advantage, but only shame and disgrace. An oracle concerning the animals of the Negev, through a land of hardship and distress, of lions and lionesses, of adders and darting snakes. The envoys carry their riches on donkeys' backs, their treasures on the humps of camels to that unprofitable nation, to Egypt, whose help is utterly useless. Therefore I call her Rahab, the do-nothing. Now, verse 7 is an interesting verse from the point of view of translation. Let's look at that. In the King James Version, Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 7 says, and I'm quoting, Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this, their strength is to sit still. End quote. The NIV, the New International Version, says, and I'm quoting, To Egypt, whose help is utterly useless. Therefore I call her Rahab the do-nothing. End quote doesn't look much like the King James Version, does it? The New American Standard Bible says, quote, Even Egypt, whose help is vain and empty, therefore I call her Rahab, who has been exterminated, end quote. 
If you are comparing translations, you might wonder, what in the world is this verse saying? How come we have so many different translations from the same Hebrew words? If you look at the Hebrew down at the bottom and follow across, you have the Hebrew term umitzrayim, which means, and Egypt. You have the word hevel, which is in vain. You have varik, and that means to no purpose. And that means that Egyptians will not help. So literally, you have, if I do this in wooden literalness, quote, in Egypt, in vain, and to no purpose do they help, end quote. Then you get the Hebrew term alken, which means therefore, I have called this. And then you have Hebrew shevet, literally a Rahab, they are resting. And so here's what it sounds like. In Egypt, in vain, and to no purpose do they help. Therefore, I have called this a Rahab. They are a resting. End quote. This is the translation if you just take it word for word, literally. Well, obviously, we have to have some kind of translation that makes sense in English. To begin, let's look at your citations, page 24, the second paragraph here, which is from E.J. Young's commentary on Isaiah, volume 2, which I think is helpful. He says, and I quote here, In vain and to no purpose do they help. End quote. Young continues, With these words, Isaiah characterizes the country to which Judah looked for help. Egypt may try to help, but her efforts amount to nothingness and vanity. They are of no help at all. They bring Judah no profit or benefit. It is for this reason that the prophet, speaking in God's name, calls the land Rahav in Hebrew. He says, therefore, I have called you Rahav. Do you see that second line? Therefore, I have called this a Rahav, or Rahab in English? Elsewhere, this term is used as a poetic name for Egypt. In itself, the word merely means arrogance, storm. Young says, it is apparently used, however, in some biblical passages to designate a serpent or crocodile, and thus refers to Egypt conceived of as a great serpent or crocodile lying along the sea. And you note that the northern border of Egypt does lie along the Mediterranean Sea. So as applied to Egypt, the word suggests that the land was a storm to let loose upon the Israelites, a storm that would devour them if it could. That's Rahab. And so we have the nation itself as a powerful entity, together with its gods, would rise as a storm against Israel. It was truly a Rahab. And that is E.J. Young's opinion. The construction of the final words is difficult. The object of the verb appears to be given in the words, quote, a Rahab are they arresting, end quote. In other words, the object is expressed in the sentence, as the Masoretic accent suggests, the words Rahab are they belong together. These words set forth the common opinion or designation of Egypt in the eyes of the Egyptians generally. They were regarded as a Rahab, a powerful monster, that could devour and destroy anything in its path. In reality, however, they were but a Shevet, a resting, and this is the irony that Isaiah is using. The Egyptians think they are a Rahab, but the Lord says they are a Shevet. This latter word designates a ceasing of activity, a period of resting, and thus forms a suitable contrast to the concept of Rahab. Thus Egypt is to be known not as Rahab, but as a ceasing or a resting. So it is a power that can be of no help to God's people. God has spoken. His mark, as it were, is upon Egypt. She is no Rahab, but only a resting. So we read, Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon if a man leans, it will go into his hands and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all that trust him. End quote. This is Isaiah chapter 36, verse 6, and I am reading from the King James. Thus Egypt perceives a new name, and here is really the way he understands the phrase. A Rahab are they? No, rather, a resting. Egypt's mighty power is gone. The nation is not that once was. 
And the implication is, to the Israelites, to the people of Judah, why would you seek help from such a nation? Now, it seems to me that that's a reasonable way to read the text. In other words, Egypt is viewed as this monster, this Rahab, this crocodile. It's like a paper tiger, though. They're not what they appear to be. They're arresting. They're weak. They're going to be of no avail. So while you may think they are a Rahab, you people of Judah, they are not. They are a Shevet, a resting. Well, maybe that's not the best word to translate it. The Hebrew word Shevet means a cessation, a sitting still. So here's this. You see, Rahab seems to have the connotation of this reptile, or crocodile, or something who's powerful. Yet it's sitting still. It's not doing anything. Now, I don't know where the newest New American Standard Bible gets the term exterminated for Rahab. The NIV, Rahab the do-nothing, seems to have captured the idea. Their strength is to sit still. I think the NIV probably gets closer to the thought of the original Hebrew, and it says, quote, I call her Rahab the do-nothing, end quote. Here's a student question. It seems to make sense for the most part, except this one point, where he leads from the crocodile to the storm. Talking about E.J. Young. I can see the metaphor of the animal here, but then it seems that the metaphor suddenly switches from an animal to a storm. What's going on here? Vinoy's response. As applied to Egypt, the word suggests that the land was a storm to let loose upon the Israelites a storm that would devour. Young says, in itself, the word means arrogance or storm. If you look up Rahav, Rahab, the BDB, Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, says literally, quote, storm, arrogance, but only as names, the mythical sea monster, the emblematic name of Egypt, end quote. So it's used for this mythical sea monster, and it's used as an emblematic name of Egypt but its inherent meaning is storm or arrogance. This is sort of an aside. It's clear that what verses 1 to 7 are talking about, apart from how you translate that last phrase, and that is the idea that they could put their trust in Egypt if Assyria doesn't work. But this is also going to be of no avail. I think something like this illustrates the value of at least having some knowledge of the Hebrew language. A lot of people say, well, why learn these languages of the Bible? We've got all these translations. Well, you see here, there's an example that at certain points, translations just don't help, even if you compare translations with translations. Because here, as again, this example shows, you're left with total confusion, unless you have some way to get back and look at the original text and see what's the basis for the difference between these translations. Let's move on in chapter 30 of Isaiah to verses 8 to 17. I quote, Go now, write it on a tablet for them, inscribe it on a scroll, that for the days to come it may be an everlasting witness. These are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, See no more visions, and to the prophets, Give us no more visions of what is right, Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way. Get off this path and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message, relied on oppression, and depended upon deceit, the sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and bulging, that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery, shattered to mercilessly that among its pieces not a fragment will be found for taking coals from a hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. You said, No, we will flee on horses. Therefore you will flee. You said, We will ride off on swift horses. Therefore, your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you will all flee away, till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountain, like a banner on a hill. End quote. 
Now, we see in those verses the people will not listen to God or to his prophets. So destruction is going to come on them, and most likely at the hands of the Assyrians again. Verse 17 tells us that destruction will be great, but that some will be spared. Quote, A thousand will flee at the threat of one, at the threat of five. You will all flee away till you are left, like a flagstaff on a mountain, like a banner on a hill. End quote. This implies the Jewish people will continue to exist, but they're going to be decimated and there will be a few left. I'm not going to say much about verses 18 to 26, but 18 to 26 present a brighter future to the people of Zion after the misery of the present judgment. It's hard to know exactly where to place the things that are described here. It's perhaps to be viewed as a peaceful condition of Jerusalem that followed 701 B.C., after Sennacherib and the Assyrians were forced to withdraw in ignominity. But it may be referring to the more distant millennial period. It's hard to say. If you glance down through this passage, we find in verse 23, quote, He will also send you rain for the seed you sow in the ground, and the food that comes from the land will be rich and plentiful. In that day your cattle will graze in broad meadows, the oxen and donkeys that work the soil will eat fodder and mash, spread out with fork and shovel. In the day of great slaughter, when the towers fall, streams of water will flow on every high mountain and every lofty hill. The moon will shine like the sun, and the sunlight will be seven times brighter, like the light of seven full days, when the Lord binds up the bruises of his people and heals the wounds he inflicted. End quote. It's clear that there's a brighter future. Whether that's a more immediate situation or a distant future, millennial period in mind, it's hard to say. Verses 27 to 33 come back to the immediate situation in Isaiah's time. It tells of the destruction that Assyria is going to experience at the hands of the Lord. Look at verse 28. Quote, Breath is like a rushing torrent. He shakes the nations in the sieve of destruction. End quote. And then verse 31, I quote again, The voice of the Lord will shatter Assyria. With his scepter he will strike them down. Every stroke the Lord lays on them with his punishing rod will be to the music of tambourines and harp as he fights them in battle with the blows of his arm. End quote. So destruction on Assyria ends this chapter. I would just take this event of the destruction of Assyria to be against them by the hands of the Babylonians. Again, it seems to me that you have poetic language here describing a victory. How far you're willing to push that when the Babylonians actually attack the Assyrians, I don't know. Did the armies have tambourines? That I don't know either. Again, you see, it says, every stroke the Lord lays on them. The Babylonians became the instrument in the hands of the Lord to bring judgment on the Assyrians. In that sense, the Lord judged the Assyrians, but it wasn't as a direct thing as deliverance of Jerusalem in the time of Sennacherib when that plague came upon the Assyrian army. I'd be inclined just to view it as a poetic description of the victory and a defeat in battle of the Babylonians defeating the Assyrians. Let's continue on to Isaiah chapter 31. I'm not going to read or go through the whole chapter, but just this comment. It's very similar to chapter 30. Many of the same thoughts are repeated in 31 as they are in 30. Look at verse 5 and 8. Quote, like birds hovering overhead, the Lord Almighty will shield Jerusalem. He will shield it and deliver it. He will pass over it and rescue it. End quote. And then in verse 8, quote, Assyria will fall by a sword that is not of man, a sword not of mortals will devour them. They will flee before the sword, and their young men will be put to forced labor. End quote. But again, I should have mentioned that the beginning of this chapter says, quote, Woe to those, meaning in Judah, who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses who trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. 
End quote. That's to be of no avail, but the Lord will protect Jerusalem and judge Assyria. Let's go on to chapter 32. At the end of chapter 31, we read that Assyria is going to fall. Verse 9 says their stronghold will fall because of terror, and verse 1 of chapter 32 sets a contrast to that. Quote, see, a king will reign in righteousness, and rulers will rule with justice. End quote. When you read verse 2, you run into a translation problem. The NIV says, quote, each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. End quote. Let's look at this phrase, each man will be like a shelter. If you compare that with the King James, you read, quote, and a man will be like a hiding place from the wind. End quote. In other words, the King James looks like verse 2 is being taken as talking about the king of verse 1, whereas the NIV looks like verse 2 is talking about the rulers of verse 1. You see, verse 1 says, A king will reign in righteousness, rulers will rule with justice. And then, is it a man will be like a shelter from the wind, or each man will be like a shelter from the wind? I'm inclined to think that the reference in verse 2 is a man, and it's the same person that's described in verse 1. Look at your citation, page 20, under Alexander's Commentary. This comes from pages 1 and 2 of his second volume, which is here, two volumes in one book. He says, and I quote, And a man shall be a, as a hiding place from the wind, a covert from rain, a storm as channels of water in a dry place, or in drought as the shadow of a heavy rock in a weary land. End quote. Most of the late interpreters give each the sense of a distributive noun. That is, each of the chiefs or princes mentioned in verse 1 shall be what they are said they would be. But the word is seldom, if ever, so used, except when connected with a plural verb, as in various other places in the Old Testament. Alexander says the meaning, rather, is that there shall be a man upon the throne, or at the head of the government, who, instead of oppressing the people, will protect the helpless. This may either be indefinitely understood or applied in an individual or in an emphatic sense to the Messiah specifically. The figures for protection or relief are the same used above in chapter 4, verse 6, and in chapter 25, verse 4. Now, I'm inclined to think that you do have a messianic reference here. The king is the Lord. That's a reference to Jesus Christ. But I don't think it's a reference to the millennial kingdom, but to the present time, to the blessings that we have in Christ now, prior to the time of the establishment of the millennial kingdom. So we read, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, princes shall rule in justice, and a man shall be, that is, king, and I feel that is referring specifically to Jesus Christ. This is very similar to chapter 4 of Isaiah. Remember when we discussed that? Isaiah chapter 4, verses 2 to 6, is that millennial or is it the present time? That's where the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. And then verse 5 says, Then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over all the glory will be a canopy. It will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and hiding place of the storm and rain. End quote. So you see here in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 2, quote, Each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. End quote. Seems to me it's speaking of the blessing that the believer has in Christ at a time when all danger is not removed. You're in a pilgrim's journey. There's still that which can threaten, and yet you can rest in the protection which Jesus Christ gives. So it seems to me that that's a reasonable way to understand what's in view here in chapter 32, verses 1 and 2. It was the same with chapter 4 of Isaiah. Appeal could be made to the hem that I think we all know. 
and I quote the verses of the hymn, Zion, city of our God, glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God, end quote. With this hymn, the Lord our rock is indeed shown. In him we hide, we have a shelter in the time of storm. The hymn continues, O Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. That's taken directly from this verse in Isaiah chapter 32, as the present experience of the believer. Verses 3 and 4 seem to me to describe the results of the activity of this man from verse 2 and the king of verse 1, and it gives the results of the activity of this man. God will give his people the eyes and the ears to understand his truth as a result of the new birth that comes to all who trust in Christ. Quote, then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed, and the ears of those who hear will listen. The mind of the rash will know and understand, and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. End quote. That's the sort of understanding and of seeing that is the result of the new birth that comes to those who trust in Jesus Christ. Chapter 32, verses 5 to 8, here's a suggestion. The division of people into two classes through the preaching of the gospel is represented here. You read, I quote again, No longer will the fool be called noble, or the scoundrel be highly respected. For the fool speaks folly, his mind is busy with evil, he practices ungodliness, and spreads air concerning the Lord. The hungry he leaves empty, and from the thirsty he withholds water. The scoundrel's methods are wicked. He makes up evil schemes to destroy the poor with lies, even when the plea of the needy is just. End quote. But, in contrast to this, the noble man makes noble plans, and by noble deeds he stands. It seems to me what may be involved here is this division of people into two classes through the preaching of the gospel. It will become apparent that those who reject the gospel, those who remain in their sin, can be spoken of as vile scoundrels or churls. Moral distinctions will become more evident as people accept or reject the gospel, so that those who are born again, who accept the gospel and live in the way in which the Bible enjoins them to live, they will be the nobles that devise noble things, and by noble things shall they stand. So the people are divided into the vile and the noble according to their response to the gospel. Now that's my suggestion for verses 5 to 8 of chapter 32 of Isaiah. As we move on to verses 9 and 14, it seems to me that Isaiah returns to his immediate situation. He says, quote, Tremble, you complacent women. End quote. That's much like chapter 3, the latter part where he describes the daughter of Zion, who are haughty and walk with stretched necks, wanton eyes. See, here he says, Tremble, you complacent women. Shudder, you daughters who feel secure. Strip off your clothes, put sackcloth around your waist, beat your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vines, and for the land of my people, a land overgrown with thorns and briars. Yes, mourn for all the houses of merriment, and for this city of reverie. The fortress will be abandoned, the noisy city deserted. Citadel and watchtower will become a wasteland forever, the delight of donkeys, a pasture for flocks." End quote. Well, I see my time is up. I think I'd probably better hold off commenting on these verses until the start of next hour because we really don't have time to get into them now. So we'll stop here and begin with verse 9 at the beginning of next hour. That is the end of lecture number 11 by Robert Vinoy on the major prophets. This is specifically the prophet Isaiah. <laughs>